Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting to order, please. If I can please bring the noise down in the room. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Budget and Finance Committee's meeting for uh, April 15th, 2019. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, joined by my colleagues, Mr. Blumenfield and Mr. Price, and we're ready to begin today's uh, meeting. Uh, we will, um, members, I'd like to... I'd like, I would have proposed uh, consent approval of items 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 19, 20, 21, 23, and 24. And I would have proposed consent approval on item 22 of concurrence with the ITGS uh, committee. Um, but we have comments, uh, public comment on those matters. So I just wanted to highlight those to see whether either of you had any questions or concerns about either of those matters. Um, we will be, after we take um, our multi-item public comment, we'll be going into closed session and then we'll be coming back out to consider those consent items and items 12, 16, 17, and 18. So uh, with that, we'll begin with our multi-item speakers. And I just feel as though I need to preface um, every meeting because we have people here who don't come regularly uh, to our Budget and Finance Committee meetings that um, some members of the public, certainly not all, just a tiny number really. Some members of the public come and utilize their opportunity to speak to this committee or to other council committees in a way that uh, inevitably many of you will find highly offensive. Um, and uh, very frequently we have comments made that are very fundamentally racist, sexist, misogynistic, um, and this is just the abuse of um, speech rights that a, a very small handful of people sometimes engage in. So I just wanted to uh, let you know that up front. And um, if you don't want to be exposed to that and want to step outside, that, uh, you know, when, I'll, when I call your name, you can come back in. That's fine with me. But I just wanted to give you that heads up. I will also say this. And um, the regulars here know this already, um, that uh, we won't tolerate disruptions of the meetings. So when people are speaking, I expect silence from everyone else so that we can pay attention to the people who are speaking. And uh, any noises, um, shouting, arguing with the chair or with members from uh, the uh, seats in the audience will not be tolerated even once. So just, uh, I wanna get that out um, right from the beginning. So let's go ahead and call our uh, multi-item speakers. F and uh, for multi-item speakers, when, if you've signed up for multiple items on the agenda, um, you'll be given uh, two minutes to speak on those agenda items. And then if you've also signed up on general public comment, um, we'll give you that minute as well, but that's going to be later in the agenda so that we can get through our work before we get to the general public comment. Okay, so the agenda item specific uh, comments we'll, we'll take now. So um, I'd first like to call, is Glenn Bailey here? Okay, uh, I know Jay Handel is here. Actually, Jay, you, you signed up only on one agenda item, I think, right? Okay, okay, so let me, let me see if I can get through some of these uh, first. Arnold Sachs, okay, Arnold Sachs is not here, okay. Is Antonio Ramirez here? Not here. Is Michael Hunt, the Red Chief here? He's not. Is Daniel Gus here? He's not. Okay. Um, and Glenn Bailey is not. Is there Mr. Holder? Okay, so it looks like all of those were um, 
fake names put in. Um, so we'll go ahead next to Mr. Spindler. Wait, I'm sorry. Mr. Previn, did, did you sign up on multiple items too? Because I'm not seeing you here. Really? Yes, he did. Why don't you come on up first? Yes, yes. But, uh, Mr. Previn, sure. that's okay. Come and speak. I, I'm just not. Well, it's a little concerned about seeing me because I, I do sign up from time to time. Yes, you do. Oh, I'm sorry. My mistake. You're here. Oh. My mistake. Well, as long as we properly chilled my speech by predicting that I'm going to be a racist. I mean. No one said anything of the kind, sir, but feel well, free to go right ahead. Reflect that I feel quite marked, and everybody knows I don't. You're speaking to the agenda items right, now, correct. so speak to the agenda right items. Now. Thank you, sir. And appreciate don't that. engage in dialogue with No, me. no, I appreciate that lengthy okay. intro. So one of my concerns uh, on today's agenda was the one that you always diminish at the very end, which is the refunds. Today's Englander, Kanabi, and Allen sponsored refund is from IBM, and it's for $175,000. Now, the reason why is they don't have the computing power to figure out their taxes correctly. They need to wait until sometime later in order to push through some public tax dollars right back to IBM. So it's not that they don't pay taxes. They just can't calculate it correct the first time. The second one is from Sedgwick our third-party administrators, they're taking 75000 back. And again, these are the ones that you guys don't want public input on because who needs public input on a cash back to the folks? Now, thank you to Mr. Blumenfield for the cashless proposal here. I think that makes a lot of sense. To try to clean cash out of the cannabis system is not a bad area because then it can be electronic and people can be up and up. I like that idea. Um, and I think it protects a lot of people. Um, I, I also think that your idea about benchmarking the way... Um, other cities deal with um, uh, capital improvement projects is an interesting area because they all do it and maybe we should be seeing what percentage of our budget should we be spending as budget season comes up. So it's a good area. I will say be cautious because frequently what they say when you ask for these kinds of reports is, oh, but it's not apples to apples. It's impossible to compare, for example, the litigation at City Hall versus the litigation at County Hall of Administration because one is bigger than the other, and therefore the excessive litigations here at City Hall can't be benchmarked against the modest but excessive litigations at County Hall. So that's why I just hope that we can get that, that right. Today on Outside Council, we have um, a little more topping off going on, but the one that always catches my attention is how could Greg Smith, the CD12 temporary waste management sit-in guy, bring into this very hall two weeks ago a $600,000 proposal into the back room is that it? Finish your thought. Ah, finish my thought. Um, for Myers Nave to get a lot of money, there are in-house attorneys who uh, are fighting all sorts of legal battles for us, and they're not necessarily complying with some of the Form 55 activities. So I appreciate okay. that, and I'll come back on general public comment. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Previn. Um, okay. Mr. Spindler. <laughs> Speaking to the agenda items, all agenda items. Don't steal your bag. You're a bunch of fucking thieves. Appreciate that. Yes. So I don't want fuck you, Robert Risk versus the city of L.A. Whistleblower. <laughs> and that means when you're a whistleblower, you're a snitch. That means you're a bitch. That means you get stitches. Snitches always get stitches. And that's why this poor person had to hire an attorney. Like, like the chair says, a tuny, tricky attorney. Yes, yeah, so he hired an attorney. Now he will sodomize you for the appropriate settlement. Number two, animal services. <laughs> I support my fellow animals, yes. Number three, Vera Shabababa, a trip and fall, of course, on Van Nuys. Good job on staging those accidents. Continue to stage more accidents in the ghetto. We support that. Number four, Imperial Highway at 66th Street, traffic accident in the hood. Yes, sir. That's what we're doing, running people over in the hood. Number five, what the hell was a city employee doing on the 71 freeway? I wouldn't be caught dead on the 71 freeway. What a disgusting goddamn thing this is. Settle the case now. <laughs> then we have beat up Kaminsky versus the city of Los Angeles on number six being beaten by police officers. Boom, boom, boom. Kick, kick, kick. 
Now the city will pay, pay, pay. And then number seven, the California Constitution, Linderman says, fuck you, the uh, permits on police alarm permits is unconstitutional tax without right. representation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you and Mr. thank Mr. you, Herman retard here. son. <laughs> Mr. Herman is not here, so that will conclude our multi-item speakers. Uh, all right, members, I would now propose uh, approval of items 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 19, 20, 21, 23, and 24. If there's no objection. There's no objection. Those, uh, it'll be... Yes. And uh, there being no objection, that will be the action of the committee by uh, unanimous uh, consent. And then on item 22, I would propose that this committee concur with the ITGS committee and approve the MFC's recommendation to increase the funding allocation for fiscal year 2018-2019 by approximately $2.6 million and continue the city attorney report and ordinance. And if there's no objection uh, to proceeding uh, accordingly, that will be the action of the committee as well. Uh, all right, and that will bring us then to our closed session items. Um, so, uh, folks, we're going to, so that you can stay here and be comfortable, we're going to... To prohibit the sale of cannabis for cash or currency. All right, uh, so we're going to hear a brief report on this. Uh, but, Mr. Blumenfield, did you want to be heard before the... Hey, come on up, come on up, Claire. Um, Mr. Blumenfield, this yes. is uh, at your initiation, if you want sure, to open no, up. I also wanted to clear something up, because I, it, it is very confusing given the way it's, the report is agendized, but it's attached to the file that deals with moving to electronic payments for the cannabis business. The report we're looking at does not deal with that question, and we're not dealing with that question today, so I see like the letter is saying opposing making the use of debit cards by patients compulsory. Nothing that we're doing today does that. Uh, and that's not what the, the report, we're going to be looking at the issue of um, what the city accepts in terms of uh, what types of payment the city accepts for paying of the taxes. Uh, I'm going to ask, you know, in, in, as a recommendation that we instruct Office of Finance to look back at providing incentives for licensed cannabis businesses to move to electronic payments, including adjustments to the gross receipts tax and that kind of thing in terms of the cannabis businesses um, to look into incentives. But what we're doing today and the report that finance is going to talk about is dealing really with the, the issue of cannabis business to the city of Los Angeles. And that's where there's, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about the tremendous cost uh, that the city may uh, incur in terms of all of this and how we move and phase out. Uh, you know, phase into electronic payments as opposed to cash payments for the city of Los Angeles. But I think I just wanted to set that stage uh, because I know it is confusing what it's attached to in the initial motion, and that certainly was the intention of the initial ordinance. But the report that we have from finances is, is very much circumspect. So, All right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for your patience. Uh, who's starting off? Okay. Um, Nicole Bernson Bernstein, here for the Office back. of Finance. Um, we're here uh, to answer any questions that you may have related to the report um, as it pertains to uh, the question of um, cash for the purposes of business tax. We are prepared to collect all forms of tax payment. So any questions that you have, we're prepared to answer at this point. Okay. Mr. Bloomfield? Okay. Great. Well, I'll, I'll jump into it. So, um, you had a very thorough report, uh, which supports the idea of moving to uh, more electronic payments. Just to mention a couple of things, the bottom of page one to the top of page two, you said, in addition to the risk of public safety, cash industries also pose various operational problems for the city, including audit challenges, crime risks, increased costs. In the middle of page two, you, you quoted, quoted saying, should the city require cashless operations by all cannabis businesses, finances, risks, and need for cash acceptance solution would be significantly alleviated. It says, otherwise, 
finance is poised to spend millions of dollars providing cash acceptance facilities and services in the next several years. Um, you have a chart that shows we're going to spend more than $2 million just in facility and direct costs of cannabis, cannabis acceptance. Top of page four goes into how finance currently accepts several forms of electronic payment, um, yet accepting cash still costs the taxpayers millions of dollars. Uh, and you talk about midterm solutions on page four. You say finance is working with the CAO to identify additional space for increasing the number of cash acceptance stations. Budget for cannabis cash acceptance is $947,000 just for staffing and security equipment and office supplies. On page five, and I just wanted to, I won't go through some, all of these things, but some of these things I think are really pertinent to this. So it's presently unknown what costs would be built for the build out of cash acceptance facilities. So there's a big open ended uh, cost right there. Finance is using the state of Oregon as a proxy. So there's, there's all of these costs that many of which you've identified, some of which you've identified as being open. Um, and you've also mentioned that there are dispensaries that are, are successfully offering electronic sales and that, and that at this point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're up to almost 60% of your sales are coming in or, or, or of, of the cannabis uh, fees are being paid in electronic payment. Is that true? We have about 56% that's coming in as cash. Okay, so I had it, I had it backwards. I, I, is that, do I have that backwards? So, 43% um, of the money that we're receiving is coming in as cash, and 56% of the businesses are paying cash. Okay, so 43% are already coming in in electronic payment. But we, and 56% or 57% are coming in approximately in cash. So clearly there's a way that there, this can be done. We can accept uh, electronic payments. There are ways to do it. And it would save this city a heck of a lot of money, not to mention, uh, without getting into too many details, I've already heard of ways that we're being sued potentially or may be sued with regard to uh, all this collection of cash, and, cash and, and what that does to employees and those kinds of things. So in as much as we can reduce our dependence on cash and, and move to electronic payments, we will be saving the city a lot of money and a lot of headache. Is that correct? Um, there is certainly a cost associated with cash acceptance, and we have put forward a budgetary request for that need in the coming year. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm concerned to, is that I, I don't want to see us just throw more money at this. And I know part of the recommendations were, well, we'll figure out how much it costs, and we'll just keep earmarking more and more of the, of the, um, the money that comes in from cannabis for our accepting of the payment. So we, we make all this money on cannabis, and instead of putting it into social equity, instead of putting it into... Uh, all the good programs of the city, we're putting it into fortifying us and making us into a Fort Knox. And I don't think that's the way we should be operating. That's not, that's not, there's, there's a lot of good things that this money should be spent on. And fortifying our departments, uh, I don't think is one of them. Uh, especially when we have the ability, legally, uh, and, and the city attorney maybe wants to speak to this, to, to phase out the acceptance of um, non-electronic payments. And is there any question about our legal ability to do that? Deputy City Attorney Dan Whitley. We did sign off on the ordinance in 2017 for form and legal sufficiency, but this was two years ago. I haven't revisited it since then. Um, I'd like to point out we did file a closed, uh, a confidential report listing our, our advice regarding this ordinance, and uh, should this go forward, we'd like to be able to provide more information on as far as that's concerned. Okay. Well, I mean, and, and I've had a lot of discussions before with the, with the city attorney on this issue as well, and, um, and appreciate that. So, I mean, the, the, what I, what I to, to sort of cut to the quick on this, and because I don't want to tackle today the bigger issue in terms of dispensaries and accepting of cash uh, that's out there, and I know there's a lot of controversy on this issue. What, what I'm going to hope that we can do is to move forward with the Office of Finance Report recommendation number one, uh, but change recommendations two and three, specifically to instruct the Office of Finance and the Office of the CAO with the assistance of the Department of Cannabis Regulation to prepare a schedule to phase out cash tax payments to the City of Los Angeles by the cannabis industry. 
So just to put together that, that schedule, then obviously it's going to have to come back for an ordinance for us at some point once you've developed a schedule. Uh, and we can look at whether it's too aggressive or not aggressive enough, and, and we can all discuss that at the appropriate time. But just to get you guys focused on getting that phase-out schedule. And then three is to instruct the Office of Finance and the CAO with the assistance of the Department of Cannabis Regulation to report back, re just report back, on a study about providing incentives for licensed cannabis businesses to move to electronic transactions in their own dealing with patients. And that would be an incentive-based uh, approach and to see, including, including adjustments to the gross receipts tax, but to, to see what you guys can come up with uh, for, uh, you know, productive incentives to make that happen. I would second, oops, I would second that uh, as well. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Price, but before I lose the thought, just to follow up on one of Mr. Boomenfield's point on the city attorney's report back on our ability to restrict or prohibit cash receipts, it also appears to me that we, we can charge a convenience fee for anybody who pays a fee with a credit card, for example. Um, and I wonder if we couldn't similarly, strangely and conversely, uh, charge a convenience fee for those who would pay in cash. I, I think theoretically we can. We would want to spend some time looking at that and okay. making sure. I, that I would want you to spend some time yes. thinking about that. And then, and then we would, of course, uh, structure that fee so that it would be a full cost recovery fee um, based on the additional cost that the city would have to incur if it were to continue to accept cash payments. So, uh, Mr. Price. Well, I uh, certainly support the, uh, the uh, comments of uh, Councilman Bloomfield about finding ways to encourage more non-cash uh, transactions. And uh, I'd like to maybe just expand just a bit to figure out how we can uh, utilize other uh, entities, in other words, credit unions or co-ops, you know, the role that they could play in this, certainly in a cashless uh, kind of approach, but uh, I think it's, I think we should try to identify all these, at least opportunities that uh, can provide some alternative uh, payment, payment schedules. So I, I would support that, Mr. Chairman. And, the, and certainly the more we do that, the more we're going to um, make it easier for the legitimate businesses and, and help you know, shine a spotlight on the ones that are operating illegally, which we've been all focused on. How do we, how do we get rid of those so that the, we can legitimize the ones that are that are here, that are licensed, and that are that are paying taxes? And and just so that I make sure that I understand the statistics, Ms. Bernson, that you raised, it, it sounds a majority of businesses are paying their taxes in cash but a majority of the tax revenues that are coming in are cashless. That's what I thought I heard, heard correct, you say. Correct. So s almost 60% or 55% or so of the actual revenues are coming in cashless already, correct. presumably in checks or some other means of payment. But that's a small minority. Oh, I shouldn't say small. It's a, it's a little less than half of the businesses are utilizing cashless methods. Correct. Interesting. Okay. Okay, um, so we are not going to take an action just yet. If I, is there anything else that anybody wanted to add to this before I take comments from the public? Okay, thank you then. Um, I'd like to go ahead and call up Sarah Armstrong, followed by Christina Marsh, followed by Jay Handel. Thank you. Ms. Armstrong, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I would urge you not to make electronic transfers the only way. Um, in July or August, you'll start getting your tax payments every month. It'll be much easier for people to pay, for instance, with um, money orders, things like that. The cannabis industry desperately wants banking, and the minute they have it, you will never, ever see them do anything but electronic transfers. And in fact, in the old days, um, we really try to keep our bank accounts long enough so we can make those transfers, make that once yearly tax payment. Um, there is no uh, bad faith on the, fa on the part of the licensed operators. They're not trying to make your life dis difficult or dangerous. As somebody who is set on the board of a dispensary, I can tell you it's 
really not a good idea to have a lot of cash hanging around. But you must be flexible and let people bring their money orders, bring their checks until we can have banking, and I hope this time next year we will. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Marsh, good afternoon. Hi. Um, I'm not so concerned about the business part and, and turning that over to cashless because I think everybody wants to go there. Demanding it all to be cashless right now is a little, a little much. Um, but please don't do that to the consumer. We can barely get them in the door for having to show an ID. If you have to make them have a little card, they won't even go get their health card because they don't trust the government. They don't want people to know they're smoking cannabis. So you're going to give them a little bank card so they have to... This is ridiculous. Let the consumer use cash. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jay Handel, followed by Nick Pacheco, followed by Sherry Franklin. Yes, good afternoon. And for full disclosure, I come to you today as a COO of a number of dispensaries on the west side and in the valley. And I have to tell you that mandating anything today without having banking is insane. This city has already become the laughing stock of all cities in California and how it handles cannabis. We're a hundred million dollars behind in fees because of all the illegal shops that have never been shut down. And if you're worried about three, four million dollars in extra fees to take cash, how about worrying about the hundred million dollars we look at as a budget team that we're losing as a city, which is 50 percent of your structural deficit on an annual basis. My question for Office of Finance, to be more clear about how they're accepting money, I've heard a lot of stories about people having to go to 25 or 37 11s to get uh, money orders to be able to fulfill not bringing cash. How much, money, how much money has been paid, Mr. Chair, through these alternate, not electronic, but alternate means like money orders where we're endangering people going into corner stores okay. with $20,000 to get money orders. Nick Pacheco followed Thank by you. Jerry Franklin, followed by Chauncey Bullock. Well, let me um, first start out by saying that the idea that the cannabis income is going to be somehow uh, used to offset the city's overall budget is really offensive to the history of how this whole economic boom has been created. Uh, we all know that the only reason that we had a prohibition against marijuana was because the West Coast states wanted to get rid of Mexicans in the 1930s. So if you're going to use money from this industry, it should be used to bring back social justice into the community, to help the people who've been uh, traumatized or basically set back by the Prohibition era, the war on drugs, which we all know started way before 1930s. It started in 1904 with William Randolph Hearst writing these incredible, crazy articles about the use of marijuana, when in fact in 1893, 94, the United Kingdom had a seven-volume report on marijuana that showed its medicinal use. In 1874, a medical surgeon for the military used cannabis to cure a five-and-a-half-year-old boy from rabies. And this is all known, all documented, but yet we act as if we're talking about some dangerous, illicit drug. <clears throat> so let me just give you this handout and just, um, okay. just try to do something more creative Thank than you. the city budget. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, this has really nothing to do with the city's budget. It has to do with the payment of taxes by cash, which would be the same whether it were cannabis or the laundromat industry or any other industry. It's yeah. anybody who's paying their taxes in cash. It's the and, and same the issue. And so the fee it's, for it's, that okay. cost, you know. That's not a problem. Uh, okay. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Shree or Sherry? Shree, Shree Franklin, yes. uh, followed by Chauncey Bullock. Yeah, Shree Franklin, uh, Cannabis of Los Angeles and the Go Verde Incubator, licensed here in the city of Los Angeles, CD9. We have uh, nine uh, operators who have been licensed. But uh, to piggyback on what was said, you, your, the report needs to be augmented to include not only how many uh, cashier's checks, where they have to go and get them, how many times their bank accounts have been shut down so that they can even be able to do that. Uh, and secondly, I thought we were focused on social equity. We haven't even had a chance to get them to the market yet, and you're going to put this requirement on them. Some of these groups are already established. You're going to prevent a lot of the social equity applicants from getting established because they do not have bank accounts. Secondly, the median income in CD8, CD9, and CD10, but indefinitely in CD9, is less than 30000 for a family of four. I employ people. 
Go talk to those people. They do not have credit cards. They do not have bank accounts. They do not have anything that they can pay with. They pay with cash. We have 265 businesses on Central Avenue that I manage through the bid. They're cash-based businesses. So you're going to lock out people in our communities from even being able to get their medicine because you're requiring a debit card, and they won't have that. And again, this is not... Is you're well, leading towards that. Like, I know like, you're not, like, but well, the conversation... Not us today. So the conversation our next speaker, was there. our last speaker on this matter will be Chauncey Bullock. Thank you. Is Chauncey Bullock here? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, members, any... Anything else? Um, so, Mr. Bloomfield, any need, need to recap? What? I mean, I, I read them the three things before. I can read them again, or no? I think I think it was clear, and uh, I seconded that. So, if there's no objection, and I just want to add the credit union and co-op. Yes, indeed. Okay. Review. Mr. Right. Chair, for the record, this matter yeah. is also referred to the Rules Election and Intergovernmental Relations Committee as well. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, the matter before us as amended by Mr. Bloomfield's motion will be the act and Mr. Uh, Price's uh, request for report back on the uh, alternative payment methods. Um, that will be the action of the committee. Okay, uh, so that will bring up then, um, we'll go ahead and take item number 12. No, I'm sorry, we'll take up item 7 and 18 together next. Item number 17 is an Office of Finance report relative to the general banking services request for proposal and agreements with Bank of America, Morgan Chase Bank, and Union Bank. And uh, concurrently, item number 18 is an Office of Finance report relative to a Sixth Amendment to the City's contract with Wells Fargo Bank for general city banking services. All right. Thank you. Ms. Bartels. Good afternoon. Welcome. Claire Bartels, Director of Finance and City Treasurer, joined today to my immediate left, Ms. Nicole Brinson, Assistant Director, and to her left, Saul Romo, our Chief Management Analyst. Thank you very much. As your City Treasurer, my mandate is very clear. First and foremost, it is my responsibility to carry out our fiduciary responsibilities of the City. As banker, investor, and custodian of all public funds, it is of the utmost importance that the Office of Finance is extremely selective in who it seeks to do business with in terms of banking. Yet that is not our sole priority. The City Council has been consistent and clear when it comes to partnering with banks. Not only must we partner with those who uphold our fiduciary responsibilities, but we must ensure that every bank we engage with is socially responsible as well. We must lead by example and only engage with banks who are fully committed to our communities, from providing branch, services, branch offices and ATMs throughout every community in the city, to investing in community and redevelopment activities, to financing affordable housing, as well as, as well as being able to demonstrate a commitment to the environment. These are among many, the many requirements for acting responsibly. I am confident that the three banks that we put forward to you t today achieve both the financial and social responsibility goals and meet the standards that the City of Los Angeles deserves. We recommend Union Bank to perform banking services for our 96 neighborhood councils. We recommend Bank of America, pardon me, 99. Beg your pardon. Oh, we hit 100, Jay? Okay. Thank Sorry. you, Mr. Handel. <laughs> to provide services for all 100. That is an awesome, awesome day. We recommend Bank of America to provide depository services across all city departments, including our proprietary departments and Bank of America to issue a letter of credit to support our uh, bonding assistance program, helping small businesses, women-owned business, and minority businesses succeed in, in securing city contracts. And we recommend J.P. Morgan Chase to provide all control disbursements, including our vendor payments and our city employee paychecks, hard checks, electronic payments uh, throughout the city. 
Now our recommendations today are driven by the competitive RFP process that we went through and which finance led. As directed by the council, finance structured the RFP for maximum co competition and maximum leverage of, of services and uh, expertise. We specifically enabled every proposer to bid on one or all of six different service areas. We conducted probably the most extensive outreach that I have seen in my time here by identifying every banking institution that well, we found 250 banking institutions that had a presence in Los Angeles and we invited each of them to participate in this proposal. As seen, uh, the robust turnout at our bidders conference held last year assured us that we got the word out. Participation was great and their questions indicated that they were seriously considering submitting a bid. And we made clear there that they would be evaluated and scored separately on their community, on their social responsibility, their community lending and investing, their any enforcement actions against them, and on environmental sustainability. And I should note that all, all banks that wished to bid to submit a proposal were required to have at least a satisfactory rating of a Community Reinvestment Act rating at both the state and the national level. All three of the banks, um, all three of the banks recommended for award, of course, um, meet and exceed those rankings. Also important to note that we required that all banks selected would have to comply with our responsible banking ordinance both the version uh, that was in effect at the time of the proposals and any future bank, uh, any future amendments, which of course last August the council amended and all of the banks have indicated their ability and willingness to comply. The evaluation of the proposals, which was led by finance, um, was comprised, the evaluation panel was comprised of five members three of whom are our greatest, our largest customers. A member from the Port of Los Angeles, from the Los Angeles World Airports, and from the Department of Water and Power. In addition, we were fortunate enough to have a staff person from the City Administrative Officer's Office and the County of Los Angeles's Treasurer and Tax Collector. I'd like to take a quick moment and express my appreciation for the participation of all of those members for doing such a thorough job and for their departments for loaning some of their best to finance for this experience. This process has truly been a team effort and I'd like to also thank the professionals in our Treasury and our Investment Division of Finance for the independent analyses that they performed in order to assist the evaluation panel by doing a pricing comparison, doing performing a uh, credit risk analysis, and performing um, reference checks, extensive reference checks across the country uh, on each of the banks. There's much to look forward to in the road ahead with our future banking partners. There's opportunities to enhance and optimize the city's automation initiatives for electronic payments, opportunities to provide to improve how we manage receivables, how we process our revenues to the city and making it easier for online access for city departments to get the information that they need to function. Finance is particularly excited to partner with each of these institutions in citywide financial literacy programs. Aim towards, we asked in the RFP that they submit to us, and they have all indicated they will do so at no cost to us, um, uh, financial literacy aimed towards underserved populations ranging from for uh, teens to seniors to our uh, minority and low-income communities in the city, something that we are all committed to. And realizing this is just the beginning for new opportunities in Los Angeles. The, social, the commitment to social responsibility, we consider the floor to our future, not the ceiling. And for finance, it's an opportunity for finance to achieve its vision of becoming a leader, a national leader in Treasury services. So we thank you for your consideration in advance, and the three of us are here to answer any and all questions you may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.
Members? Questions? <coughs> Let me say thank right. you. First of all, thank you for the, uh, for the, uh, for the report. I'm, I'm prepared to accept the recommendations that's made. All these institutions um, uh, certainly have a record uh, and history of working in a collaborative way, and I'm, I'm pleased that they passed your rigorous uh, due diligence uh, for the recommendation. I'm, I'm concerned, um, I know all the banks met a minimum of satisfactory with their community reinvestment um, programs, and I certainly appreciate that. But I, I'm, I, I just want to make sure that we uh, have some um, ongoing way of, of measuring uh, their support of, of these requirements and, and following through on these requirements. So how can we, what can we do to learn more about the, the plans, the community reinvestment plans each of these three banks are making, and, and what's in place that will permit us to just to monitor uh, what's occurring over the course of the, this is a three-year term? This is actually a five-year term five -year with term. an additional option. So what, uh, what's, what's built in so that there's some kind of regular review, if anything, over the next five years on an annual basis to monitor how the... Indeed. At a minimum, thank you for asking, at a minimum, finance requires a resubmittal and our review of the responsible banking ordinance um, uh, requirements. So um, before we uh, finalize the contract, all of the banks will submit to us uh, an updated version um, of um, the completing the checklist for responsible banking, some of the things you've alluded to and more. Um, that which was contained in the RFP, but we will be um, uh, executing an actual, um, they will attest to all the commitments that they are making and all the commitments they have already delivered upon um, in an annual basis. Finance ha certainly has the capability as we go forward to check with them more frequently as we partner on projects together in all of the areas or any of the areas. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just appreciate this in our role of oversight. If we could get a, get a hold of that uh, uh, that report on an annual basis, how they are the banks are meeting their their community responsibility absolutely function, so that we can just monitor and, and uh, be informed as we move along. Mm -hmm. So we have just now completed the um, the new form based on the revised ordinance that the council just adopted last year. We'll be happy to distribute that to you as well, but it's going out to all banking partners, uh, both the ones before you and those that are currently doing business with the city. They'll be required to submit um, this July, and we will be happy to share it with you. But in addition, we post it on the finance website um, in a um, orderly fashion yeah, for review. It's better. Uh, and reports to come to this committee, I think, will be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Very welcome. Okay. Mr. Okay. Mr. Well, I think Mr. Price asked the... Uh, the best question, and, and I second the motion and the idea, or not, it's not a motion, but I second the idea of it. And I'm just, I want to thank you guys. You did, a, did good work on making this happen, and um, it's uh, a long time coming, and we're, we're finally getting to this to this spot, and I think this, it's, a, it's a good place to be. So thank you for the good work. And I just final note, I'm especially impressed with the degree of the outreach uh, to identify every single financial institution that touches the city of Los Angeles and specifically reach out to them, including all of the community banks and credit unions and everything else. That's, uh, that was a lot of work and it was important work. So thank you. Worth it. Um, I, so I have Mr. Handel signed up for this matter, but Ms. Roberts, I'm guessing you wanted to speak on this matter as well? Was, was, the banking one? Okay. And Mr. Because I had you signed up for general public comment. So if you, if you folks, thank you. If you could make room for the public speakers, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to call up uh, Jay Handel, Beverly Roberts, uh, Patrick Smith. Did you want to speak on this, this matter as well? Okay. And Orinio Opinaldo, followed by Giselle Mata. Go right ahead. Jay Handel speaking as the treasurer of the West L.A. Sawtell Neighborhood Council. Uh, I want to thank the Office of Finance and, and the city clerk's office for um, finally getting us a banking and financial situation that has made sense, that has worked pretty seamlessly. Don't, don't all fall down. I'm giving good stuff here. Okay. Uh, I, I've been treasurer now for two years, and I have to tell you, it, it's just, it's easy and it's seamless, and Union Bank has been terrific. 
in working with neighborhood councils in a system that took years to try and devise. So this is a great call, and knowing that their social equity, social justice standing uh, is as good as it is it makes it kind of like the whipped cream on top of the ice cream. But from a, a treasurer's point of view, uh, I would definitely tell you Union Bank has been fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, good afternoon. Greetings. Um, we are happy to hear that the city of Los Angeles will not be banking with Wells Fargo a bank that opened 3.5 million fake accounts without customers' knowledge or permission. We see it as a great step forward that the city has moved on from this relationship. We hope to find um, accountability at the banks you have chosen. But before the contract is finalized, these banks need to disclose the sales goals. We need banks to disclose um, uh, whistleblower protection and how they use sales, sales goals before Los Angeles does business with these, with those big banks. That's my All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Smith, followed by Orinio Pinaldo, followed by Giselle Mata. My name is Patrick Smith. I have a member of ACE. My wife's name is uh, Brunilda Prado Smith. The only difference between Wells Fargo and Bank of America is that Wells Fargo expertise in stiffening the community was, was a sales goal. Bank of America expertise in stiffening the community is foreclosure. They have not invested no money in the community to help the community. All they have done is take advantage of the elderly and minority. We want to make sure I've been a victim of Bank of America because we have a loan with Bank of America that will charge us, that have set us up for foreclosure, which I think is ridiculous. We want to make sure that, that the RBO is in force to ensure that banks, crooked banks, like Bank of America, do not get compensated for their wrongdoings by getting the contract to handle LA City banking ac account. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Orinio Opinaldo, followed by Giselle Mata, and that's the, those are the only speakers I have on this matter. Thank you. Sir? We have organized thousands of bank workers here in Los Angeles and across the country. And what we have learned will not surprise you. Bank workers want to give sound financial advice, not push unnecessary and often harmful practice at their banks to put their workers and consumers at risk. We hear that there is a new language being finalized that takes into account the changes the city council made to the responsible banking ordinance last year. These changes require banks to now disclose whether their sales goals are based on customer service or selling products, where they are individual or collective, and whether employees are evaluated, disciplined, or possibly terminated for not meeting the bank's sales goals. As it stands now, these banks have not reported on these important factors, and we would ask that they do so before the contract is finalized. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And our final speaker in this matter is Giselle Mata. Sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bank workers coming together as Committee for Better Banks has uh, speaking up and speaking to uh, those in authority in Washington, D.C. has led to uh, first John Stump stepping down from Wells Fargo and then Tim Sloan stepping down um, just two weeks ago. So we know that when bank workers speak, CEOs tumble. And we want to make sure that the um, Committee for Better Banks continues to organize bank workers here in California to make sure that taking on sales goals, which we consider predatory towards our community, uh, stops. Uh, Wells Fargo uh, opened up three and a half million accounts. They revealed metrics that led to predatory auto lending at Santander Bank. Um, Committee for Better Banks took on debt collection metrics at U.S. Bank. 
Um, these bank workers made history in Los Angeles last year. They worked with city council to amend the city's responsible banking ordinance to make sure that the city does not do business with these banks who have predatory sales goals. So let's make sure that we enforce these, uh, the responsible banking ordinance we all worked so hard on and um, make sure that the uh, Office Thank of Finance has full support from its community. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, all right, members, any other discussion on these matters? Uh, if not, um, is there any objection to moving forward with the Office of Finance's recommendations no. on 17 and 18? Okay, there being no objection, that will be the action of the committee as to items 17 and 18. That brings us to our final matter, uh, item number 12. Item number 12 is a city administrative officer report relative to the disposition of funds identified in the city controller's March 29, 2018 correspondence on special purpose funds. Good afternoon. Give it just a second, okay. please. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Rexler. I'm at the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Uh, I'm here to report on our report on the disposition of funds that were identified by the City Controller. Uh, back, uh, his report was released back in March, and your committee subsequently uh, asked for a report from our uh, office and several other offices on uh, sort of the opportunities to, to dispose of those funds, to use them for other purposes. Uh, in his report, the controller identified 123 special funds with a cumulative balance totaling about $28 million. And uh, all of those funds, he noted there had been no action on them for at least four years. So he designated these funds as idle funds. Uh, your committee asked us to work with city departments to identify actions that could be taken to use the balances of these funds, including looking into the opportunity to repurpose funds, whether for the same uh, purposes but with... But, uh, or for different purposes, also to repay the reserve fund to the degree that was possible, to consolidate these funds with other special funds where they could be spent more readily, or if there is a zero balance to look into closing those funds. So we uh, reached out to all the city departments that were on the list that administered these funds, and we worked with them to identify actions that they could take to uh, use the balances of these funds. And uh, for the most part, the actions that were taken, that, that could be taken, are simply administrative in nature. Departments can, whether, you know, use them for other activities that are eligible or transfer them to other accounts. Uh, but there are a handful of, of actions that would require council action, and our report does include those recommendations. Uh, the re recommendations in this report related to those include transferring uh, some of those funds that originally from the general fund back to the unappropriated balance reserve for mid-year adjustments. That's only about $34,000, uh, but this action would bring that, these funds into that account uh, to be used this year to close other budget issues. In addition, uh, there is a pending reserve fund of $225,000, which in the support we're recommending be repaid at this time. Uh, and finally, another uh, major action was a transfer of about $3.3 .3 million from a uh, transportation special fund into the ATSAC fund, which is where th those funds initiated. And uh, those funds can then be used for the upgrade of, of that system. Um, so departments have already begun doing this work as we, as we talk to them and work with them because many of these actions are administrative. And since the initial report was reviewed, about five million, the balances have gone down by about $5 million. Uh, and there are other departments that are still going to be forthcoming with reports to address some of the remaining balances. Uh, for example, the Economic, Economic and Workforce Development Department, uh, they administer many, many of the funds on the list. Uh, they are going to incorporate all the recommendations related to their uh, the, the funds that fall within their purview in their annual plan report, which I'll be releasing later this year, so, and they will find uses for the balance of those funds. There's an attachment to the report which identifies all the actions for every single special fund that was on that list. Uh, because, like I said, most of those actions are administrative. You, you can see what's going to happen with those funds in that attachment. Uh, but th there's no action that's necessarily required by council at this time for, for m many of those actions. I'm available to take any questions you might have. Great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and your office for the thoroughness of this work. Um, this, 
this is the nitty gritty detail that's been missing um, in all of this discussion. I mean, it's very easy to, you know, sort of throw out cumulative totals of um, special funds. Uh, the harder part is getting down into each one specifically and identifying why it is that there hasn't been activity in that fund. And typically it's be for very good, very specific reasons. And so um, what this report gives us and what these recommendations give us, I think, is the roadblock uh, or roadmap for fixing the, you know, challenges that some of these funds have had and at least getting to a point of disposition on, on just about all of it. So, um, so thank you for that work. Members, questions on this one? Mr. Bloomfield? I'm good. Really? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let me ask one. Mr. Price? Give, give, him, give him some thoughts. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, uh, for the report. I noticed that there are a couple of funds that don't have recommendations for appropriation uh, yet. We're going to be hearing back uh, from the departments, namely Fund 303, the Industrial Commercial Revolving Fund, Loan Fund, and 307, the Rental Housing Fund. Uh, I'm interested in learning more about these specific fu funds and the department's plan for allocation. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like mm -hmm. to get a report back uh, to the committee on these items. Um, Certainly. In addition to anything else that, that may be coming forward. Certainly. Fund 303 and Fund 307. 303 and 307? Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else, members? All right. Uh, if there's no objection then or other recommendations, um, is there any objection to moving forward with the CAO's recommendations as stated? Any other changes? Okay. Very good. Then uh, that will be, it will be action of the committee to approve the city attorney, the CAO's recommendations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, that concludes our agenda items. So the only items remaining are general public comment. Mr. Spindler. Yes, yeah, so we noted that when it comes to your friends like Jay Handel, you'll let them talk separately on items, but not the rest of us. And you'll make us wait all this time to speak at one fucking minute of general public fucking comment. So just remember, we had to sit here two and a half hours. So when you're sitting in traffic two and a half hours, waiting to get home to your big fat fucking wife and your little fucking faggot, little H-rag, little retard, just remember that what you continue to do is denigrate us. You warned your audience that something is offensive and we are somehow abusing the First Amendment. No, you abuse the First Amendment because number one, you're a goat. <laughs> number two, you have a retard. <laughs> and number three, you don't have a bar license. So pay your fucking bar dues, take your fucking courses, Zab, or get Zab, the Zab, fuck Zab, out of the Zab, goddamn Zab, city. Quietly. Silent. Mr. Previn. Thank you. It's Eric Previn from Studio City, uh, and I, I'm just reaching out because I know we've got the budget um, coming up on by, I believe, the 20th of the month. The charter requires that the mayor publish his, and then by the 30th of the month we should have a schedule. And I'd like to just ask that during the hearings on the budget, where the budget advocates and the others, Jay's on the budget advocates, others, will we'll come before the city and provide testimony. It's important that they be able to hear the department's presentations and that time slots be at least, you know, try to be firmly affixed at the first round. Because then people know that if they want to say something about cashless or BOE, it, whether it refers to just to the Office of Finance like today, not the cannabis, we don't want to alarm anybody, you know, then they could speak on that. But the current system of, and we should use your system, sir, of giving them the minute at the front if they want to get out the door and leave, not listen to the testimony. But if we have both, I think we'll be um, inviting the public to participate, which will accomplish the meaningful scrutiny. And maybe we can get away from that weird special meeting component that I think needs to be rethought this year. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Okay, I forgot that you, I, I didn't. That's okay. I no problem. Comment. I'm easily forgettable. Sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> rescind the adjournment and uh, Mr. Handel. Take it ahead. back. Thank you. Um, Jay Handel in the capacity as co-chair of the Budget Advocates. I'm here to deliver each and every one of you a actual report in case you haven't seen it yet. Um, and we would welcome the opportunity after it's been read and digested to come before you again and uh, go through the reports and some of the recommendations we've made because we think after almost nine months of very diligent work by 36 people, um, they at least deserve to have that time in front of both budget and finance and the council uh, to review the work that's been done. And on that note, have a good ride home. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Handel. And on that note, there being no other business for the committee, we are adjourned.